they would turn carriers around just because of the EA-6B mission. Landing on an aircraft carrier. You're going from 150 miles an hour to zero in about two seconds of the span of 340 feet. How do they pre-detonate IEDs from the plane? We can do it before they do, then we have control of when that bomb goes off. What goes on below the deck? Seems like maintenance never stopped. It was the loudest aircraft on the deck. Bones in your head are rattling, that thing's at full power. Four-man party van. We would uh, fire our missile by committee. 10 different radios. You have to almost play your communications panel like a piano. Hi, I'm Rick Crandall, host of the Behind the Wings podcast, and we are really excited on this episode to be speaking with two EA-6B crewmen, pilot Matthew Marr and Naval Flight Officer Ethan Williams. We got so many questions from our previous Prowler video that we had to come back and do an update. Well, you know, after all, you're who we do this for. It's time to go Behind the Wings. Okay, let's get started. Matthew Marr, Ethan Williams, welcome guys. Great to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So you uh, both enlisted in the Navy pretty early in your life. Each earned a spot on the uh, EA-6B. Um, Ethan, you mentioned you came from an, an Air Force family, but decided to attend the uh, Naval Academy instead. What was it about the Navy over the Air Force? I think there was more opportunity to fly. I knew from an early age that I could not be a pilot, you know, the stick and rudder guy, but I thought the Navy had better opportunities for uh, navigators, systems officers, and others to still fly, plus the opportunity to not just fly, but fly off of aircraft carriers. Couldn't say no to that. You said very early on this was what you were planning, so you knew all along. Was there a point when you got there that you thought, well... There was one point where I questioned whether I belonged there or not. The first ever test that the Navy ever gave me, I failed. And I was on the bubble from, from then on to, for the rest of officer candidate school, meaning if I had failed one more thing, I was going to roll back two weeks, and that seems like a lifetime at officer candidate school. Sure. After that, no. Uh, when it got to the flying aspect, it uh, felt very natural. Let's start with uh, MIWAT. You know, you've flown a lot of different other kind of airplanes, so what was it like to fly that thing? When you see a fleet aircraft up close for the first time, it's big, it's gray, pretty ugly airplane. I didn't select it. it the Prowler selected me. I definitely wanted to fly Tomcats, Hornets, anything at all other than uh, the Prowler. And uh, it ended up being an amazing airplane to fly. The first time I ever actually got to fly the A6B, I was impressed with the power, the acceleration, the J52 P48 Alpha engines are uh, very, very efficient, very powerful down low. I was fortunate enough to fly that for about a thousand hours. Three different deployments, 62 combat missions, and um, several hundred carrier landings. There's four seats in this airplane, if you're not familiar with the A6B, but what position did you have in the airplane? Well, so as a, a Naval Flight Officer, I was an Electronic Countermeasures Officer in ECMO. Front right seat is the ECMO-1 position, doing the communications, the navigation, working the radar, working our communications jammer, also working our uh, high-speed anti-radiation missile, the HARM. Uh, if I'm flying in the back seat of uh, two identical crew stations, so ECMO 2 or 3, then I'm doing the uh, jamming, the electronic attack, electronic support missions. I think one of the unique things about the, uh, the Prowler with the kind of the way the crew is set up is we would uh, fire our missile by committee. The guys in the back seat would find the target, get the parametrics of it, they would put that into what we call a package, send that to the front seat, ECMO 1, the front uh, right, would then verify the coordinates, verify the information, and then send that information via the harm control panel to the missile. And once that was ready, then the pilot would fire it. So it took basically three, at least three people to fire the uh, high-speed anti-radiation missile in the uh, plane. How long do you train in that before you make your first carrier landing? So your first carrier landings are at the T-45 uh, Gossok or the, prior to that, the A-4. And then uh, the first time you fly it, you are flying with someone who is a pilot in the right seat. So only in training is when that happens. And after that, the, the ECMOs take over. It's an art form for them to be able to coach and teach a new pilot without having any controls and just using their voice and different techniques they've learned to instruct. So it took a year from the ground school all the way until I went to the carrier for the first time in the EA-6B. 
and I was an instructor ECMO, so I, you know, I was one that helped train the pilots in the Prowler. It wasn't that hard in the sense of that these guys are proven aviators. They have their wings, they've already been to the boat, they've already been flying some. So, you know, it's more just the kind of the sweet spot of kind of the little more little technique things and also teaching them the mission. We got a lot of comments saying it was the loudest aircraft on the deck. I would say that decibel level was unique because of the, the, the cans, the way they angled down. And so I would go out there with my chief and watch the cat shots, you know, and, and you'd be standing next to it. And if you had molars, like it feels like they're rattling, like everything inside the bones in your head are rattling when that thing's at full power and you're just 20 feet away. Uh, there's a reason they wear double hearing protection. It's, it is a noisy, noisy airplane. You know, people are always interested about landing on an aircraft carrier. Meanwhile, you have over 600 traps. First time you do a carrier landing, you're by yourself. No one's with you. Uh, that was a tradition that carried over from World War II when they lost a lot of instructors in training and they needed them on the front lines. I'm orbiting, I'm looking down at the small little sliver of a ship and I thought it would look a lot bigger. And I, I started questioning my career choices at that point. <laughs> uh, but by the time that you come into the break, the, the training kicks in. Hundreds and hundreds of practice landings you've done on a painted carrier box. They're called field carrier landing practices. You're so overwhelmed by what you're seeing in front of you, this, this pitch, pitching deck, and there's a very vertical face behind it, and this is daytime. And you just do your best to stay on glide slope, land on center line, land with the power on the jet, and things work out. Nighttime, very intense. You look out there, it's just a small little sliver of light. I almost like night landings better in some respects because you don't get the whole ship, you just get to focus on the, the landing by itself. And then all of a sudden the rush, in the last 15 seconds or so, you get the rush of the, of the deck coming at you. And you're coming down at six to 800 feet per minute, up to 1400 feet per minute without damaging the airplane because that deck could be coming up and pitching with sure. you. Sure. At night, you really don't see the pitch unless you have a lot of experience. And then you start to see the angle of the lights changing. And sometimes the, the, the landing area lights will just disappear. And you're like, well, pitching deck out there or LSOs, if I was an LSO, paddles will say, 99 pitching deck, uh, and they'll switch to something called a Moveless, which is a manually operated uh, lens, where they show you where they want you to be on glide slope. That's to account for the deck and try to get you in sync. Worst I've seen was off the coast of Australia, and it was a 30-foot pitching deck, where you know, you're, you're go seeing up and down movement of an excess of 20 feet, and you're just aiming for something relatively in the middle and hoping it works out. That's why we always land with power on the jet. You have to be ready for that bolter, otherwise you're just gonna dribble off into the ocean. Bringing it aboard the ship was truly an art form. I didn't appreciate how difficult that was until I flew the Hornet and flew the Growler. And that was incredibly easy compared to the, the Prowler. They made 170 of them, crashed 51 of them over time. So we were included in every combat operation. They would turn carriers around just because of the EA-6B mission. What's it like living below deck? Give us a little bit of feel for the maintenance that needs to be gone. You know, the amazing thing is it seems like maintenance never stopped. You know, both you know, a day shift and a night shift, you know, trying to keep the planes going all day. So usually you know, our maintenance guys are up, as we call them, the flight deck on the roof, turning them in between every flight, getting them ready for the next flight. But then there's always maintenance going down, down in the hangar bay also where you know, some of those deeper problems or inspections they're working on, pretty amazing seeing just the work that maintainers could do. One time the estimate was 80 to 100, as high as 100 hour, maintenance hours for every flight hour that we would fly. So it, it took a, an intense effort for our maintainers to keep these things flying. I'm just thinking about what you're asking of the airplane, driving it into the deck of this carrier. You're going from 150 miles an hour to zero in about two seconds over the span of 340 feet. When you're taking off, you're going zero to 150, 160 miles per hour in 310 feet. With a 56,000, 58,000 pound airplane on launch, 48,000 pound airplane on landing, that is a lot of mass and inertia that is being yanked around and beaten up. I can say that not once in my 62 combat missions in Iraq did I ever cancel for maintenance because our maintainers are that good. The airplane is good, but it's not, nothing without the maintainers. They would change an entire engine and get us flying for the next cycle and miss no coverage. Tell us how exactly the EA-6B provided support on the battlefield. When I first came into the Prowler, you know, we were sh shortly after the Cold War had ended, so we were really focused on how do we jam those radars and uh, you know, their associated uh, surface-to-air missiles that are the threats. So then comes 9-11, and we're going into Afghanistan, and after about day three of Afghanistan, there's really nothing left in terms of surface-to-air missiles for Afghanistan. So now 
we switch over towards more of a communications jamming mission. Then fast forward a few years, we're now in Afghanistan and Iraq, and we have the improvised explosive devices that are uh, plaguing the battlefield. And many of those activated through things like key fobs, garage door openers, cell phones, that then the Prowler community then pivots once again, and we're able to then work some uh, jamming that either denies the ability to detonate those or uh, pre-detonates the uh, IEDs uh, before they're a threat to our troops. So, um, you know, quite a diverse, uh, you know, just in the last 20 years, how that electronic warfare mission has changed with the Prowler. We learn a lot on this show, don't we? It's good stuff. Let's talk about the flow of operations between all four crew members. We touched on it a little bit, but, but Matthew, if you would, how did the pilot work together with all three ECMOs? There's some different nicknames that they call this Prowler, the, uh, the, the flying drumstick, what, mom and the kids, the minivan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the minivan. Yeah. Four-man party van. Four-man party van, <laughs> that's a good one, yeah. There's a lot of coordination. You have to almost play your communications panel like a piano where you are selecting what you want to hear because we had nine, ten different radios between HF and MIDS and the standard three UHF VHF, UHF VHF the scanner then you've the scanner comms jammer USQ 113 and then you've got four seats that you're filtering comms through that was an art form at first very overwhelming you know, specifically like when we're working in the back seat what we would do oftentimes is just select so we were talking you know between ECMOs two and three that way we're not clobbering his headset and the ECMO one so if we're flying the airplane getting us to where we need to go in the right spot and we're in the back, you know, heads down into our um, displays there, you know, trying to uh, get the uh, jammers onto the right targets there. One of the questions that we got from, from somebody saying, how do they pre-detonate IEDs from the plane? Say so without getting into too many specifics, obviously there is a signal that bomb will receive from the bad guy, so to speak, and our smart guys in, you know, the electronic warfare community were able to figure out, you know, how do we mimic that and we can do it before they do, and then that way then we have control of when that bomb goes off. So Matthew, after your career in the EA-6 Prowler, you know, you've moved on to other aircraft. So talk a little bit about the F-18 and, and the Growler. The digital flight control system, um, fly-by-wire, is, is just a dream to fly with. The EA-6B was, um, was not fly-by-wire, so it's fly-by-cable, but they did incorporate digital flight control system in about 2007, I got to uh, do the first ever functional check flight on the first EA-6B with DFCS, Digital Flight Control System. That was a game changer, it really was, because I, these things fly with flaperons, which kill lift on each wing, and they don't, so you're not rolling about a center line axis, instead it's, it's you kill lift on one side, and you have to account for that with some power additions. F-18, every control surface out there is working for you. There's uh, your ailerons, your, your big stabilators, your t rudders, even your speed brakes. They're all working in the background. You just make it happen, put your stick where you want it to go, tell the airplane what you want it to do, it responds. Real dream to fly, a lot of power obviously. Uh, went from non-afterburning to afterburning engines in the F-18 and the uh, Growler. And I think one of the biggest advantages from um, the transition to the, from the EA-6B to the, to the Growler was the self-protect capability where you incorporate the air-to-air -air missile uh, from the AMRAAM. If you are in the EA-6B, we would be assigned to have a protection, uh, how about air aircraft uh, and asset protection. So they would assign a Hornet or some other pointy nose aircraft with AMRAAM and uh, AIM-9s and other air-to-air -air missiles to escort us into and out of the target area. And, and now the Growler doesn't, doesn't need that escort. We can do it all in-house. All right, let's get down to the brass tacks. Growler and Prowler, which one was better? Here's my political answer. <laughs> For its time, the Prowler was amazing. If you put a Growler up against a Prowler now, the Growler is obviously a better airframe. It's a better airframe because of all the things it can do. It advances the technology. It is packed full of systems and, and it's easier to maintain. It's all solid state, fly by wire. You can bring it aboard the ship with less effort. You have a heads-up display. You have an amazing AESA radar, airborne electrically scanned array radar. So for those reasons, I'm gonna to have to say that Growler is clearly a, a better airplane. What advice do you give someone who is approaching the idea of entering the aviation world? First of all, you know, be the best at whatever you're doing. Try to have a, you know, a great resume coming in. Don't have your heart set on one, um, one airframe. 
I think if you were to go ask across the fleet, I bet they're going to tell you they love their plane, they love what they're doing in it, they love their community. Bloom where you're planted and uh, have a great time flying. For the, the ultimate naval aviator, be humble, approachable, incredible. Humble enough to know that you need to be a lifelong learner. Approachable, where you're going to be the mentor. You're going to be someone who's going to instruct and teach and pass along these lessons. Incredible, so you got to continuously study, be up on your tactics, know the airplane, and uh, that's going to carry you all the way through a very successful career. And I'd say be ready for failure. And when you fail, fail quickly and have resiliency. Get back up and, and press forward, compartmentalize, and move on. Ethan Williams. And Matthew Mark, thank you very much for, uh, for joining us today. It's a pleasure having you both here. Well, that'll do it, folks. We sure hope you enjoyed Matthew and Ethan's many stories. I know I did. Which one was your favorite? Hey, let us know in the comments. And to hear the full interview, go check out episode 44 of the Behind the Wings podcast. If you subscribe, thank you. And if you haven't, come on, subscribe already. Oh, and by the way, come to the museum and see the more than 60 air and space craft here in this beautiful World War II era museum and hangar. That's gonna do it for this episode. We'll see you next time on Behind the Wings.